So I come from quite a normal family, really. I was brought up in a well, fairly middle-class estate, and uh, my parents' kind of philosophy in teaching my sister and myself was to do whatever you want to do in life, you know, be independent, um, whatever makes you happy. That was kind of the philosophy at home. So myself and my sister grew up in a, a, in a very loving home, and my father, unfortunately, he was an alcoholic, and uh, I don't say that for any, any kind of sympathy, really, but I, I guess it kind of it paints a picture of, of my upbringing. Just a couple of years ago, I found his blackened body in his flat dead. And it was a horrific day just walking into the flat, the place covered in, in rubbish and flies. I mean, it's horrific how alcohol had really gripped him, you know, and he'd become a slave to it, really, to the, to the point of death. So yeah, I guess I've seen firsthand the, the power that addiction has in somebody's life. I know there's going to be people watching this with worse stories than me, and, but it does paint that picture, doesn't it, of one of, of freedom actually in growing up. My dad not around, and, and really I abused that freedom, and, and it led on to so many horrific things. As I grew up on this estate, um, I got involved in the wrong crowd really. I guess at home I was kind of always the little boy <laughs> um, and I wanted to be a man so really I, I began to hang around with uh, the wrong kids on the estate. By the age of about eight actually I was started smoking and then by the age of ten I was beginning to get involved in drugs and and glue sniffing. I think I was always really looking for the next high, the next thing. I wanted to be the man in the group and and I abused it really, I made so many wrong decisions in my life, really I did and so from the age of 13 my next wrong decision was to get involved in something called the Ouija board. People think that uh, as you play this, what they call a game, you're actually talking to, to dead spirits. And for me, I didn't think there was anything else out there. I didn't believe in any afterlife or anything. But as I began to play this Ouija board, well, it began to give me information about the future. It gave me information about my exam papers at school. So for the first time at school, my grades were going up. I thought I was talking to my dead granddad. There was information coming back about my family that well, nobody else in the room knew about. And it was really... Well, actually, it was really quite exciting. It gripped me, and, and I became so obsessed with playing this game. So I guess as a, as a young man um, looking for something in his life, playing this Ouija board, well, it gave me that excitement. I can tell you it utterly gripped me. So as we got more and more involved in playing this game, we just literally meet up around one another's houses. So we'd um, just get straight from school. We'd come to one of our houses and literally we'd just set up the, the board in the room and we'd make it ourselves. You have to make a, an alphabet and, and there's an object in the middle that would spell out the words and. And at the beginning, it was just a joke, really. It was a bit of a laugh, a bit of a game. But then it began to spell out things that really nobody else in the room knew about. Maybe it was a, about a relative or a friend. And you could just feel the whole atmosphere change in the room. It became heavy as we realised this is a little bit more serious. I remember being at school and and just thinking, oh, I can't wait till school finishes so we can go and start again and do it again. And literally every decision in life was becoming about playing this game. And We even used to do it outside after a while. We'd set up a board maybe with a cigarette packet or 
and we play along the canal or maybe at school around the back of the bike sheds and I even remember being in, in shops and looking to steal stuff and asking this game, am I going to get caught, is anyone coming and the answers were always right and well it just got darker and darker. So we became so obsessed with playing this game that we just wanted to take it really to, to the next level. So the next step was to actually invite these spirits to come into our bodies and this was the fatal decision that we made. So as I um, actually invited these spirits to come inside me, well, I began to hear um, strange voices in my head and again these voices were quite positive telling me things about my future and, but this game that I've been playing while on this board well it had now actually come inside of me. Look I understand that actually my story is a really strange story, it's weird but I hope that you understand that the only reason I share it is, is because it's true and it happened in my life and really I can't escape that. And I guess by this point in my life I was just getting more and more gripped and I was just going further and further down into, well just into darkness really. So uh, one night we found ourselves outside a church and um, well we were just causing trouble really, we were throwing stones at the building and just making lots of noise really and then this man, well he just came out from the church. So this, um, this man began to talk to us about Christianity, I guess he kind of fitted the stereotypical view. I had of Christians a bit kind of out of the world and, and not part of things but he was really nice actually and he just began telling me about Jesus and, and I was far from nice to him. I was spitting on the floor in front of him and just telling him where to go with his Jesus Christ. But at the end of the conversation he said, look I really want to, I want to pray for you. And I remember thinking, why does he want to pray for me? You know, I'm, I'm throwing stones at his building, I'm spitting in his face and he wants to pray for me. And while well, he prayed for me, he had his hand on my shoulder, and, and Christians, they pray in the name of Jesus. As soon as he mentioned that name, it was like my whole body just tensed up. And it was then really that the man realized there was something more serious going on. So he actually invited us um, back to the church to be, to be prayed for and really for me it was then that things actually turned upside down and as people prayed for me, these spirits or what I now know to be demons would actually physically take hold of my body. You know in the Bible it tells us that um, there are angels and there are demons and these demons are actually angels that have been cast out of heaven and live on this earth. And it was really those things that were possessing me, that were in me, these demons. There were so many terrifying things that happened at this point in my life. I even remember being at home and smashing the mirror in my house and, and with the blood from my hands writing the word die on the mirrors and, and really it was terrifying.
what was about to happen next was going to change everything. One day, um, I was chasing a friend down a railway track, and these demons actually, well, they actually physically took hold of my body, and they lay me down on, on that train track. I had a, a group of friends who all stood above me on, on a footbridge, and, and they were all shouting out to me to, to get up, to get up, what are you doing? And I physically, I, I just couldn't move my body, and, and there was a train coming towards me on that line. And I thought, well, I'm going to die right here on this train track. I could just picture the newspaper stories. So just before the train was about to hit me, it was like someone or something literally grabbed a hold of the back of me and pulled me bolt upright. I then had the train whizzing past the front of my face. And, and the reason I mentioned my friends on that bridge is because they can all testify that there was no one stood behind me. There was no human being stood behind me. You see, I believe in that moment that God has literally pulled me up off that train track. After this um, incident on, on the train tracks, uh, I ran to my, my friend's house, you remember that Christian man, and uh, I just explained to him everything that had happened. So I remember him saying to me that um, he'd been praying for me and praying for me at the church, but he said that I needed to make a decision to turn and surrender to Jesus Christ. I don't think I really fully understood what that meant to be honest, but I just, I just wanted three of these demons really, and I just, I just literally just prayed to this Jesus Christ. And one of the things that I want to testify to you here on this DVD is that Jesus Christ completely healed me. You know, I've seen the power in the name of Jesus Christ with my own eyes, and what He did, He completely healed me. So after that we, um, we gave an assembly at school and uh, we told our whole year group what had happened and, and uh, a number of people became Christians and I started going to church and, and really life was great and my whole life had taken just a completely different turn. So as I um, began going to church, um, things were great for a while, uh, but I guess, I don't know, as I started reading the Bible and spending time at church, I, don't know, I just felt like a lot of rules and regulations and as if, you know, God was trying to somehow spoil my fun. But really, uh, I just turned my back on church. Um, I guess I just grew up and, and lived a normal life, went to college and got a job. I was just looking for happiness. So I, I'd set myself um, like new targets. I think, well, if I just get this thing, then I'm gonna be happy. You know, if I just got that girl or if I just got a bit more money, then I'm gonna be happy. But each time I got there, there was, there was something missing. I thought, well, maybe if I go traveling, I don't know, that maybe that's the answer. So I found myself um, travelling to Thailand and uh, we found ourselves at a tropical island. I don't know if you can picture it, but sunshine and beautiful white beaches. And I brought myself a bar and a restaurant with an old school buddy and I thought, well this is it. Yeah, there 
was something missing. And I thought, well, what is life all about? You know, why are we here? I mean, what's the purpose of our lives? So I decided to come back to the UK and I thought, well, maybe God does have the answers. And I decided I was going to go back to that church. Remember that one I'd been in all those years ago? And uh, one of the first things that I heard there was the story of the prodigal son. And I don't know if you're familiar with that story, but it's all about a boy who wants his father's inheritance early and he goes off to a distant land and he squanders that money on wild living and, and he realises he's empty, he's got nothing. It says he came to his senses. He said, what am I doing? He says, well, if maybe I'll just go back to my father and just beg him for a job back, say how sorry I am to him and to God. And well, he decides that's what he's going to do and his father sees him from afar off and he absolutely runs to his son throws his arms around him and gives him a big kiss. And I guess for me, in that moment, the pennies started to drop, because that father is God. And that's the love that he offers every single one of us. It's not about rules, it's about a relationship with the living God. I understood um, about that father's love and that it was God <laughs> I realized this is what I've been looking for searching in all those different places and I kind of realized I'd, I'd come home I just remember being in that service and and crying you know I had waves of acceptance I knew God had seen all the things that I'd done wrong and how I treated him yet he accepted me back, he wanted this, this relationship with me. And I had questions definitely after the service, you know, what about the Bible and what about science, where does that fit in, what about all these other faiths? And but as I investigated all those things, I've got answers and, and God has, has completely transformed me. So I've now um, become a Christian. I follow Jesus Christ. I centre my whole life upon him. Uh, all those things that I struggled with before, you know, like purpose and, and meaning and, and being trapped in my heart, finding freedom in Christ now, it's, it's amazing. And look, I don't want to tell you that, you know, life is a bed of roses now and everything's okay. And, you know, circumstances in life are tough sometimes. But that thing in my heart that was missing that purpose, that meaning, well, I found it in Jesus Christ. And as I've built my life on him, well, he's completely rebuilt my life. I now work with an organization called Avanti Ministries, and I get the opportunity to travel around the world and to, to share this story, really, with, with many people. I don't get paid to do that. Um, my only motive for doing this is, is because God is real and I've experienced him and I want other people to know this God and, and really that is my only motive. I'm married now to uh, a beautiful woman called Kate and uh, well I'm a bit of a romantic actually. I took her to, to Paris and uh, took her to the Eiffel Tower. I got down on one knee and I said to her, will you, will you be mine? I said, will you marry me? And, and thankfully she said yes and we're now married. But I guess the reason that I share that story with you is I think it's just such a great picture of what God does to us. It's a bit like God is, is on one knee saying, will you be mine? Will you come back into relationship with me? And there was two things that I did that got me back into that relationship with this living God. And there's a video on this DVD and I encourage you to have a look at that video and, and well, make up your own mind. 
But I really want to thank you actually for listening to some of my story and, and I hope I get to hear yours one day too.